Howdy y'all. The video that I'll be responding to in this video was sent to me by two different people in the last uh, 24 hours. One on Patreon and one on Twitter, which is a little, little bit odd because the channel from which it comes is quite small. Uh, anyway, it's a Korean guy who's done a video titled Gun Rant. Second Amendment Rights and White Supremacy. Um, the guy is a musician and former journalist. I can see why he's a former, former journalist because everything about this little homily of his is slightly just wrong, which is very common among the left. Anyway, the uh, it only has a few thousand views, a small channel, but the like to dislike ratio is like 61 to 11, but the comments are overwhelmingly negative, so I don't know how that flip comes over and what fact that bears out, but in any event, I'm going to try to respond to some of the uh, the more relevant points to, to my purpose. A lot of it is about Christianity, which, uh, not, not to throw a wrench in your monkey works, sir, uh, a monkey wrench in your work, sir, but I'm an atheist. Like, one of those really annoying atheists who's like, hey, I'm an atheist. Fuck you. Anyway, uh, take it away, my little Korean friend. Onyashi Mika Arashi. Hi, I'm Yong Nam Goon. I'm a musician and former journalist from Seoul, South Korea. Every fucking time I watch an American presidential debate, of course, especially a Republican one, I get astounded by how intellectually superficial and philosophically foundationless those political folks are. I am just surprised, shocked to learn that you would be surprised to learn that politicians really portray themselves as being stupid. I find that shocking. Maybe in South Korea you just have a, a better crop of politicians. The way they discuss the gun control issue in arguably one of the most heated subjects in the current U.S. society explicitly shows that lack of basic perception in their categorized group mind. Donald Trump is only a... This is just a series of words that are loosely cobbled together. So, uh, just grin and bear it. <clears throat> ...temple. At least he provides entertainment and whatnot, was way more ridiculous than the overly highlighted individual caricature figure is actually the whole rest of the opinion network Word that salad. has been vividly re-represented through the recent Trump phenomenon. Here I'd like to talk about the Second Amendment as an example because all Republican presidential candidates almost literally parrot the word based on blind faith. Saying American people can have guns because the Second Amendment supports gun ownership is just like saying we have to reject homosexuality because the Bible says so. The problem here is twofold. Uh, well, there are several problems with what you've had to say, one of which is that all Americans are actually Americans, but not all Americans are actually Christians, and not all Americans believe themselves to be governed by the Bible, and even among the group of people who do believe themselves to be governed by the Bible, Quite a lot of them don't think that it uh, prescribes homosexuality, which is a bit of a, a queer interpretation of the Bible, if I do say so myself, but that's no problem for me. Uh, I'm not a member of the faith. I don't have to explain away uh, or justify any of the nonsense that they perpetuate. First, there's... Oh, and the distinction there is that all Americans think that the laws of America govern what happens in America. Not all Americans think that the Bible governs what happens in America. Indeed, most people don't believe that, even among the Christians. Matter of interpretation. Just like homophobic Christians never try to interpret the Bible through the proper process with sincerity, America... The proper process, which of course I'm sure you know the, the one absolute way to properly interpret the Christian Bible. The advocates of civilian gun ownership don't <laughs> give two fucks about what the Constitution... Buddy, one of the things I care most about in the world is what the United States Constitution says. I'm willing to die uh, to preserve it, and by the same token, I'm willing to kill to preserve it. It is in my interest to make sure that I get the understanding of it quite correctly, since the, the, uh, the value that I place on it, what I'm willing to risk in order to see that it perseveres, is so expensive. It is so high, namely my life and the life of well, really any number of people throughout the world. I don't care how many people have to be killed to preserve the United States Constitution. If it's the other six billion people on the planet, yes, I know there are, uh, well, there are more than six billion people outside of the planet, but there aren't a billion people outside of the United States, not outside of the planet. There aren't a billion people within the United States. But my point is, I don't care if we have to kill the entire rest of the world to make sure that the American Constitution continues to, to govern over this continent. Or at least our, our small part of it means. Therefore, second, the matter of application. 
they only argue that people just have to obey the preconceived criteria, whether it's the Bible, the Constitution, or Fox News, no matter what the fuck happens in the current reality. Not to mention that no one's actually under an obligation to follow such a doctrine. Right, this is a wonderful argument. No one is under any obligation to follow the dictates of the law. Well, that was a bit of the the beginning view of, uh, of our founders. They, they, at least certain laws they thought they didn't have to follow anymore, which is why they committed treason against the king. But in any event, um, no, it, it is simply not true that people aren't under an obligation in the United States to follow the United States Constitution. It does, after all, purport to be the supreme law of the land. Here's a reality check. In the United States, there were over 13,000 gun deaths last year, according to the Gun Violence Archive. And every town estimates that 88 Americans are killed every day with guns, according to the CDC data, based on which a reporter from the Washington Post even argued last December that guns are now killing as many Americans as automobiles do for the... That's actually not true, but it doesn't really matter to me one way or the other. Uh, all you've managed to do is point out that there are consequences that, comes, that come with, well, living in a society that operates by certain rules and uh, doesn't operate by other particular rules and that rights have certain consequences. Uh, the one of which you'd like to advert here is the large number of corpses piled up because of the evil Second Amendment. Cry me a fucking river. First time. Just a... Just to close the circle on that argument there with your automobile issue. Uh, more people are killed in automobile crashes every year than are killed by firearms. And this is just to uh, serve the convenience and luxury of a Western lifestyle. If you can take in your stride these many thousands of deaths every year from automobiles, which is over 30, between 30 and 40,000, and uh, that doesn't give you any pause. And I'm certainly not going to lose any sleep over the fact that a lesser number of people are killed for an essential fundamental uh, liberty of the American people. 65 years. The San Bernardino, California attack on December 2nd last year was confirmed as the deadliest mass shooting in modern U.S. history since the 2012 Newtown, Connecticut shooting at an elementary school, which killed 28 people, including... So it was the deadliest since the last deadliest. Okay, that's very not interesting at all. 20 preteen students. Unlike whatever Trump says, it's not a mental health problem. It's a fucking gun problem. Guns are not just tools. No, no, it's not a gun problem. It's a liberty problem. That liberty is dangerous, as Jefferson put it. Uh, I much prefer a little dangerous liberty to a bit of peaceful slavery. When something contributes to unintentionally and automatically kill... Oh, these firearms don't contribute to unintentional deaths. Uh, almost all of them are intended. You know, someone picks up a firearm, points it at someone else, and then pulls the trigger. Like, very few of them are, are unintentional. Like, someone thinks it's empty and kablooey, someone is dead, or, you know, it falls out of someone's purse, or someone's kid gets a hold of it. Those do happen, but the, the mind run of these aren't unintentional. These aren't accidents. These are suicides. People don't, they're not accidentally suiciding themselves, going, well, I don't know what's going to happen. Oh, look at that, like Bud, Bud Dreyer. Um, and all the, all, so you have the suicides, and then you have the murders, and various versions of homicide, and all these kinds of things. Almost none of them are unintended consequences. Uh, all you do here is point out that liberty can be dangerous. Welcome to America, a country founded on liberty, not on safety. The American Constitution doesn't start in order to bubble wrap the universe, in order to form a more perfect union. It is for liberty and liberty, and then there's a bit about welfare and whatnot, but uh, the, the, the thread that goes through the whole of the Revolutionary War, right up through the Civil War, right up through modern day America, is the, pre the preservation and maintenance of liberty over and above other things. Like, you know, your quest for a bubble wrapped universe. A large amount of people. It should be viewed as an alternate subject. It's guns that kill people, obviously. I'll save this topic for the other day. So, how could we, whether you're American or a non-American like me, uh, interpret the famous Second Amendment properly? Uh, the answer... I don't know, by reading the words and understanding them, that's what I would try, but dazzle me with, <laughs> with your scholarly analysis. Analysis. It's context. 
No text on Earth is given by itself without its temporal historical background. But many people just try to or want to forget that fact. For example, the majority of Christians tend to think that the meaning of the Bible is best revealed when we just accept its content as truth and believe everything it says. But as philosopher Gadamer pointed out 50 years ago, the true nature of a text is discovered through a fusion of horizons. You know, the curious thing here is that what philosophers have to say about what the law actually is isn't relevant. They're not lawyers. There's a reason that the Supreme Court isn't made up of nine philosophers, although at Justice Kennedy, you've got at least one ninth of them, or an eighth of them now, who seem to want to be philosophers. It is completely immaterial. Philosophy might be wonderful for the, the, the voters who want to draft a new constitution, or draft a law, or whatever to, to contemplate when they're evaluating what laws to adopt, but what laws have in fact been adopted don't turn on what philo you know, modern day philosophers have to say about anything. You know, there... I, I can't recall any court cases. You know, it goes up on appeal and the lawyer walks in and says, well, you know, uh, behind door number two, whoosh, I have a philosopher. And the judges go, oh, thank God you brought a philosopher because those are really the people who bring clarity to language. There is the communication between the Texas context and our context here. That's why the last century so-called continental philosophers focus so much on are completely irrelevant to legal analysis. The deconstruction work, that is, restoring the context behind the text so he could be led to the reality that the text is truly... I think he means that context is actually two words, one of which is, you know, like a con man, and the other is, you know, that, that's the con part, and then the text part, you just swap out man for text. And uh, then you have con text, it's, how, it's convincement text. I think that's what he means by, the, by using the uh, con text. Pointing to, this kind of approach and method are, are applied not only to literature, but to any kind of text, including the Bible, and of course any country's constitution. No. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep in their arms shall not be infringed. This is the well- A beautifully written phrase, although James Madison seems to have gone a little bit crazy with his newly discovered implement of writing, aka the comma. No text of the Second Amendment of 1791. Now what is the context of this text? It definitely starts- uh, The context that- the most relevant context to having written the United States Constitution, adopted the United States Constitution, and then amended, uh, having amended the United States Constitution, is a little event, a little soiree that had just happened, namely in where uh, the Americans had killed thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people to insist upon the right to rule their own lives. And that a key feature of that quest that they had just gone through was the individual American owning his own firearms and bringing those to bear to depose or cast off their tyrant. Gee, what could they possibly have meant? <laughs> it's a complete mystery. From the English built... Incidentally, what was the event, the seminal event that kicked off that was, you know, what was the shot heard around the world, the original uh, shot heard around the world, as Emerson put it in, in, a, in a poem later on? It was when General Gage marched on, Lex on Lexington and Concord and tried to do what? <laughs> Wanted to confiscate their arms and then serve some uh, warrants. Rice up. Didn't work out well for him. 1689. He got a reprimand from his boss. Which could never be properly viewed without an understanding of the glorious revolution of 1688. Through the overthrow of King James II, the last British monarch with absolute power, uh, King James II did not have absolute power. Uh, you could quibble, like, when who was the last absolute uh, monarch of England? You might want to say it's like King John when Magna Carta came about, but Magna Carta was a bit of a fiction written on paper for a while. I mean, it was promulgated and then rescinded and then reissued and rescinded. And this went on quite a bit for the next several centuries. Uh, but certainly the end point, uh, the last possible absolute monarch of England is... James the second father, Charles the first. I think any claim to actually have an absolute monarchy died when Charles the first's head came fucking off of his shoulders on the block when they went, Waka! no more. And then you know you had the uh, the interregnum, 
and then you had the Restoration, and this is where you have Charles the, uh, the uh, sorry, James the Second, well, Charles the uh, Second. Here, here's you had James the First, who had a son, Charles the First, who apparently had a short temper and lost his head, and then you had Cromwell, and then you know Cromwell died, and then you had the Restoration, which was uh, Charles the Second who died. He was a son of. Um, Charles I, and then James II, who was the brother of Charles II, so also the son of uh, Charles I. And, uh, and, and then, well, things didn't go well for him when he wanted to be an absolute monarch, and then there were Catholic issues. Uh, he aspired to have a very strong sovereign, which didn't go well for him. Then he had the Glorious Revolution, and then he had William of Orange, who became William III, of England along with Mary II of England and they were joint monarchs. So James II was not an absolute monarch. The revolution ho opened a whole new way for Western politics and that is called parliamentary democracy. Meaning political decisions are now made by a group of actual people called parliament, not by some pseudo-religious leader anymore. So it's quite Who clearly aren't actual people understandable that the new right for the non-establishment people to keep them bear arms naturally and inevitably. I suppose I should distinguish here. The, uh, the English Bill of Rights of 1689 followed the glorious revolution of the previous year. This is when they decided to once and for all codify by statute that you didn't have an absolute monarch, um, which had been the practice for a while at that point to include having abolished the monarchy itself and then falling to the despotism of Cromwell and then having the restoration of, of the crown. But monarchs, since, well, John, uh, had not been absolute monarchs. Uh, you know, they had to call for the parliament to raise tax. I mean, there are all kinds of restrictions that have been placed on, on the monarchy, but in any event. So distinguish between when a statute was written codifying what was really in practice already happening versus when that practice came about. They aren't the same things. Particularly in, in the common law tradition where things aren't, uh, they don't need to be codified in a statute to be the way that it works. Had to be requested to protect this historic change. The problem is how this background was imported to another contextual environment of North America by the English settlers that formed the 13 colonies there. Incidentally, who formed the, the colonies here under James I, you know, the father of Charles I, who was the father of Charles II and James II, neither of whom was an absolute monarch. And uh, incidentally, the founding fathers, the framers of our Constitution, were aware of the way that uh, Charles and James had um, tinkered with the militia so as to disarm the political dissidents while letting remain armed those who were loyal to their particular quests, their flights of fancy and quest for glory and whatever else goes with being uh, a wannabe absolute monarch. Our, our founders were very familiar with what was done to usurp the actual capacity of a militia to oppose uh, a king or a central power or a power in general. We're first divided into two groups, loyalists and patriots. No, uh, the original militias here, the original folks here, they weren't divided into loyalists and patriots. You know, this goes back to Jamestown in 1607. They were all loyalists, you know, by and large. Well, there are only like 30 of them. Patriots. Patriots wanted to be free from the British rule by creating their own... And this, this uh, pretty much consistency of view about uh, favoritism, you know, favorability towards the British crown... Uh, was true right up until the American Revolution, and indeed even during the American Revolution, this is what gave, ri uh, gave rise to the Olive Branch Petition, they still wanted to be subjects of the crown. They still wanted to be British colonies. They just wanted to have a say over their own internal affairs, and their, their uh, well, their ta no taxation without representation. No taxing without representing, yo. Uh, so it, it, was, it was essentially there was no... Well, the parties didn't exist at the time, but there's no distinction uh, at that time in 1607 between Tories and Whigs. It didn't even make sense to talk about a division of parties because everyone was in favor of the king. Militias, which grew into the confrontation between the British Army and the Continental Army led by George Washington during the American Revolutionary War. Then when the independent United States of America began, there was another division between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. 
the post-colonial North America was at a crossroads between a revival of a monarchy or a succession to the new wave of people's democracy. The United States Bill of Rights was established in that period to uh, limit the power of the federal government so that each state's militia didn't have to be disarmed. No, it wasn't Therefore, to it wasn't to do that so that way the state's militias didn't have to be disarmed. This is an auxiliary to liberty that having the militia is a guarantee against all the other calamities about which the founding generation were concerned. Uh, you know, taxation without representation, taxing without representing, uh, freedom of religion. By the way, in the states at the time. Uh, there were established churches. If you go read like uh, Article 3 of the Massachusetts Constitution, uh, they had an established church. Religion was mandatory and you could be punished for not, uh, for not attending church. Protestant services uh, at, at that, if, you'd be, uh, if your scruples thereby allowed. If not, it would have to be something, Some, I guess they gave like a dispensation. I don't know how it worked. I didn't live at the time. And reading through the language of the day is like, I don't know, there was this period between the founding and now where they decided just to go crazy with writing in really abstruse language. But in any event, uh, that these were matters to be decided in municipalities and localities, uh, not, to, not to be rhyming here, and at the state level, not, not a centralized authority. It wasn't so that the state militias would not be disarmed. And indeed, at the time of the founding and, well, even right up to modern day, but at the time of the founding, there <clears throat> were different classes, <clears throat> different classes of militia. You had government-sponsored militias. You know, these were people in the pay of the government, and then you had private militias. Uh, I've talked about the Minutemen. I've talked about the Green Mountain Boys. There were others, and uh, these were private militias who, if the government asked them to do something, they would say, "We'll do that," or "No, go pound sand." And they said, go pound sand, and the, you, know, you have to go find some other way to get it done, because clearly the militia was not at the beck and call of the legislature. Uh, we still have different classes of militia today. It's fucking obvious that a well-regulated militia in the Second Amendment refers to this kind of collective armed force, which is... Well, I think that anyone who wants to talk about a militia has to concede that it involves more than one person. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I realize it's a, an advertising slogan for the army today, an army of one, but I don't think you can really be a militia of one, because then you're just, well, you know, that was crazy Frank, and you kind of... <laughs> He kind of got what he deserved when he decided to go challenge the government, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, so yes, it would be groups of citizens operating together. But, but the crucial thing here is that they may or may not be operating under local control or federal control. And for the first 150 years of the nation, it wasn't decided, and indeed it's not even, uh, even now, there's a division between the, of the loyalties of the National Guard, for example. Uh, that's the organized militia and the unorganized militia. The organized militia has dual loyalties. It's loyal to its state and it's loyal to the federal government. And how that would play out in some division, some contest between the federal government's want to rule and the state's want not to be ruled is anybody's guess. Quote, necessary to the security of a free... So a well-regulated militia, if you read the context of the day, and here by context I mean, you know, what those words were understood by the society that adopted them. I don't mean context as in like con man where you swap out text for man. Well regulated simply meant properly function, functioning, orderly, uh, organized, uh, something that it did not mean uh, regulated as in what we think of it today with lots of government regulations. That's why I mentioned that at the time of the founding you had private militias and public militias and the private militias did not serve uh, the sovereign they did not serve the executive. They did not serve parliament. They didn't. Uh, they did not serve the legislatures. They did their own own kind of thing. And anyway, state. And until the National Guard was first formed through the Dick Act in nine. No, the National Guard was first formed in the 1630s. That's where it traces its lineage to, uh, and that was enshrined in law to include in the Dick Act and the Militia Acts of 1792. Anyway. Uh, but the actual National Guard as a concept, like so named, comes from uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, 
who, as you may or may not know, was not around in 1903 when the Dick Act was agitated for and passed into law. It predated that, I think, the 1820s or something like that. It, it, but it comes from uh, Lafayette, a very important person in American history. You know, three state militias actually acted as the main military power of the United States for... No, it didn't. Uh, if you go read, like, Joseph's story in the middle of the 19th century, he bemoaned the, uh, the lo lo loss of status and viability of the militia. The fact, the fact that the militias were getting uh, smaller and smaller and they were being subsumed by a standing army. They were being over their function was being overtaken by a standing army. This goes all the way back to the War of 1812, where they were really building, you know, they, like, I think quintupled or quadrupled or they massively expanded the amount of federal expenditure that went on having a standing military uh, to include, by the way, you know, when Madison was president, a good navy, though not a really great uh, standing army. And the militia was still used for that, but the, the, in, the inability of the militia to perform well against uh, organized armies uh, under the confines of the day gave rise to wanting to make sure that we had a good standing army. Uh, Madison came around to this view, well, he obviously did his War of 1812, uh, many of the other founders started to realize that you, in the modern world, as things are changing ever more, you're going to have to have a permanent force of some size that needs to be on guard to deal with the Indian, pro the, the, the then Indian problem that we don't have today for some inexplicable reason, and all hosts of other problems. Uh, so this this notion that the militia is what stood guard over everything for the previous century is just a fabrication of your mind. It's just not true. Within a century. So why do these gun believers now keep invoking the Second Amendment to support the fabricated idea of an individual right to <coughs> militarize themselves against other individuals? Uh, because it's not fabricated, <coughs> and it is. If the right to self-government means anything at all, it means the right of the people who are going to be consenting or not consenting to a government to be able to, uh, to depose, to enforce their will, upon a reluctant government. As Judge Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit has put it, by the way, he immigrated here from Romania uh, after his parents escaped from Hitler, but any, in any event, that the Second Amendment is a doomsday provision for those exceptionally rare circumstances where uh, judges have lost the courage to issue decrees, where they cannot find executive officials to enforce their decrees under law, where governments will not stand for election anymore, uh, they will not let the people vote them out. They will not go willingly. It is the right of it is a doomsday provision that says, well, once you reach that state, all bets are off. Who knows how it's going to work out? But it's going to have a high body count. I kept talking about the Bible. And the American people, if we've proved anything in in our history, it is that we are there is no body count so large that we're unprepared to see it paid in order to insist upon these liberties. You talk about you know, nine eleven. And you know, 3,000 people died in 9/11. That was pretty much like every week of the Second World War. Uh, you look at the the death toll in in the Civil War. We will go through whatever fire is required to be gone through to insist upon these personal liberties. And you and those like you come and be a threat to American liberty, as Americans understand it, to include the Second Amendment at the hazard of your own life. Well, today, choose wisely. Choose wisely because I wanted to point out how big of a role Christianity is playing in this matter. It's not a coincidence that most of American white conservative Christians or evangelicals tend to stick to the status quo. The problem you have is that may well be true of white evangelical American Christians, but the, the gun-loving, constitution-loving uh, citizenry is not restricted to that class, and that class does not predominate the number of those, like me, atheist, not at all conservative, who will fight you to the death right here and now for the United States Constitution. Like I've, like I've said, there is no body count so large I'm unwilling to see it paid in order to make sure that the United States Constitution, the, United, the flag of the United States, continues to fly. Uh, all takers, you know, come and get them if you want them, but you do it at the risk of your own life. Of the so-called gun epidemic. Oops. One moment.
I guess I'll edit this little bit out. Not a coincidence that most of American white conservative Christians or evangelicals tend to stick to the status quo of the so-called gun epidemic because it was basically born as the collusion of white suprematism and Christian imperialism. I told you that the context of the United States Constitution and Bill of Rights was originated from the spirit of the Glorious Revolution. Yeah, you say that so. <laughs> That's where fundamentalistic Americans fundamentally find their existential basis from Christianity because superficially it was Protestants that overthrew the Catholic King James II and established the modern parliamentary system. They're focusing on the replacement of an ideology with another ideology rather than the historic renewal of a system because systematic innovation makes them feel threatened. That's really strange to say to Americans. We, uh, we kind of took the, the notion of parliamentary democracy, the Westminster system essentially, and decided to, to tweak it and then, you know, depose a king, throw off a tyrant, and establish our own way. Uh, that has led to the world's only standing superpower, the most powerful economy in the history of the world, the most prosperous people in the history of the world, the most successful country in the history of the world. Uh, this is all, I guess, just a big old fucking accident because we're un... Well, you were talking about the Christians. We're, we're afraid of change. We just want to replace an ideology with an ideology. No, the, the little engines of democracy, the little laboratories of democracy that we have here are the means by which we test different models. And when something works exceptionally well, we say, oh, we'll take that. They want to keep living in a white society with the exclusive privilege forever. Look at United States v. Crickshank, the first known Supreme Court case related to the interpretation of the Second Amendment. Actually, anyway. In which the white... Let's talk about Dred Scott, which references it uh, slightly earlier, but anyway, go on. Man ...who slaughtered dozens of black people in the Colfax Massacre in Louisiana in 1873 were charged with violating the black free men's right to bear arms. Funny thing is, the justices then made clear that the individual right to bear arms is not granted by the Constitution because the Second Amendment quote, has no other effect than to restrict the powers of the national government. It's curious that you've managed to leave out a little bit of intervening text between uh, not granted by the United States Constitution, which is true, no rights are granted by the United States Constitution. It is not a, a liberty-granting instrument. It is not a rights-granting instrument. Uh, so anyway, it says that these are not granted by the, US, by the, the Constitution. And then the next sentence is, um, and nor do these rights depend on that instrument for their existence or their effect. It, it does not depend upon the existence of the United States Constitution for their existence. The rights are not, uh, the source of our rights is not the United States Constitution. That's merely the codification of, of our rights. It, it's a, it is a shorthand way of establish, of, well, essentially what doing law is. You say, here are some norms, here are some things that we want to codify. And uh, whenever anybody wants to say we should, you know, ignore whatever this is and do something else, we can just, as a shorthand, go, oh yeah, looky there. No, you can't go do that thing that you want to go do until you persuade or conquer the rest of us. And you're certainly not going to persuade us to give up this whole liberty thing to, oh, you know, fuck the republic, just toss that in the rubbish bin of history, clearly. This republic thing ain't working out. Let's just get rid of it. And this democracy bit's like, oh, yawn. Yeah, that you're not gonna, you are not going to persuade the American people of that series of propositions. So conquering us or submitting to us is all that remains for you and your ilk to do. Curiously enough, conquering us is going to be difficult for a number of reasons. One of which is we have the most powerful military in the history of the world, and the second of which is we have the best armed. Uh, citizenry in the history of the world. On either front, you're kind of fucked if you come here and try to uh, foist upon us your your will. And that works, by the way, whether or not you are within the United States government or without the United States government. If you try to foist this upon the American people, it will be war. Note that this case greatly contributed to... Oh, yes. Uh, I mentioned uh, Dred Scott. A dreadful decision. One of the reasons that uh, that uh, Dred Scott came out the way that it came out, if you read the opinion, is that 
my god, if we recognize the citizenship of these black folks, that means they'd have, like, all the rights of citizens, and they could, you know, partake of free speech, political advocacy, advocacy. Uh, they could come and go all hours of the day and night, unmolested by authorities, and that they, like all the other citizens, could, care, could keep and carry arms wherever they went. It is, there is no doubt in American law that the right to keep and carry firearms, to keep and bear firearms, is an individual right. The reinforcement of the infamous extreme white supremacy group, Ku Klux Klan, who killed thousands of black people to openly suppress black voting around the time. You know what would have been really useful for those black voters at the time is if all of them had been heavily armed. It is exceedingly difficult for a group of nutbags like the KKK, even at its heyday when it had a you know, million or so people who were members all throughout the country, uh, to get together and oppress uh, millions upon millions upon millions of extremely pissed off and heavily armed black folks, or any other group of voters for that matter. That was one of the, like Taney said, uh, he understood well that you don't want those black folks to be armed. A, an armed population is not a servile population except by consent. The National Rifle Association, NRA, founded in 1871, started to flourish too. The, no, gun rights in, in, in America have had no greater enemy for the first part of its life than the NRA. There was not a gun control law. They weren't exuberant to see passed into law. And indeed, they wrote some of them the models for these that were enshrined into law, like when, when uh, this was being discussed in the 1930s, they said, well, look at the great work we did in New York, writing you know, this statute and that statute and the other statute, this provision of law, that provision of law. If you just incorporate these wholesale into the federal system, mirabile dictu, things will go great. You'll get what you want. NRA, we're all for government power over civilians' rights uh, to firearms. It wasn't until the 1970s uh, for the first time in its history that the National Rifle Association first met the first statute that it didn't love. I mean, it said, well, you know, we're not, we're not super in favor of this one. In fact, we might even have to disagree with it. And then people are like, oh, how come you've become politically active? They've been politically active their whole time. The difference is, is that after nearly a century of this, this endeavor to encroach upon the rights of ordinary citizens to own firearms, the NRA finally decided to go, you know, maybe, we, maybe we're going a little too far. We should, we should ease up on this shit. Years after they had an annual meeting in 1977, they called the Revolt at Cincinnati, where they decided to sponsor scholarship and lobby politicians. I believe that one of the revolts was against the internal politics of the NRA to continue agitating for ever more encroaching gun laws to turn public opinion in favor of their gun rights, mainly based on the distorted interpretation of the Second Amendment. Their plan completely reached this goal after 30 years through the landmark case of 2008. Uh, he's going to talk about District of Columbia against Heller. The NRA opposed District of Columbia against Heller. They did not want that case to go forward. After it was already in the Supreme Court, and, you know, the die is cast, they decided, well, you know, I guess we better get on board because this is going to be the way it's going to go, so we don't have any choice. Even in, in, in to that period of time, they were hostile to, the, to arguing full-throatedly for the rights of individual American citizens to just keep and carry their own private fucking firearms. The NRA is no friend of gun liberty of Columbia v. Heller, in which the white police of... In addition to that, uh, Wayne LaPierre says a lot of stupid shit. Sir Dick Heller filed a complaint on the district's refusal of his application to register a handgun to be kept in his home, and the Supreme Court to rule that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to possess a firearm unconnected with service in a militia. Here we can realize how actually deeply racial this fucking concept Right, a white guy got justice in court. RACISM! <laughs> Although, the wonderful thing is, about a right of, of citizenship is that it inheres into the individual. Whether it be a white individual, a white-bodied individual, a male-bodied individual, a female-bodied individual, 
or a black-bodied individual. They all have the same right, and uh, they can access that right or abdicate it uh, as, as the mood hits them. Go, hey, go with what you know. Do whatever works for you works for us. Uh, the, the difference is, is that in these dark cities like District of Columbia and, and Chicago and others, you know, where you have a lot of black folks, the governments work exceedingly hard to restrict access to constitutional rights. Why might that be? Not my problem to solve. Only all that I need to do with respect to the Constitution that actually exists, as opposed to the one that you would like to write for the American people, is to say, uh, is there such a right that is guaranteed? Why, yes, there is. Is this right being uh, denied by the government? Why, yes, it is. And the denial of the right should stop. And citizens, black or white, can make use of it. And by the way, another, another thing about uh, citing, adverting to U.S. v. Crookshanks is that this was pre-incorporation doctrine time. This was before people had really worked out. Uh, you know, these new amendments we got in the, in, you know, after the Civil War, what do they mean? Uh, how do they apply? What's the, has, does this change the relationship between the states and the federal government uh, with respect to incorporating the Bill of Rights, uh, making them applicable against the states? And, uh, you know, that was debated for a while, but in the fullness of time, it was, yes, actually, it did do something, and now even the states cannot go around usurping the rights enshrined in the United States Constitution, um, with a couple of exceptions for petty issues like uh, jury trials for uh, in civil civil in, uh, civil cases, and then uh, well this isn't this is not exactly trivial but it is nevertheless true that you don't need a grand jury to indict that's still uh, restricted to just the federal government but putting it off to the side um, when you look at you know substantive rights that no the states you're kind of in for a penny you're in for a pound. You just have to respect the rights of American citizens that they get uh, by virtue of being American citizens. It's no longer in your remit to say, we will have an established church uh, or any of these other things. Freedom of religion, these, the, this writ will run through all levels of government from sea to shining sea. ...of an individual is. It's worth noting, especially in this Black History Month, uh, that during the Civil War period, and even until the last century's uh, African-American Civil Rights Movement, gun control used to mean mostly taking guns away from black people. You're completely right that for a long time that's what it was. But now it is to give it to these black citizens in these, these towns, like District of Columbia. Not really a town, it's a whatever it is. It, it's, it's, a, it's a weird enclave, but in any event, it's to give to these black folks, not to give to them, because it's not within our power to deny it to them. It's to stop the government from usurping these people's liberty. It's not to give them liberty. It's to make sure that the, in, the uh, impediment to their exercise of their natural rights is removed. And in this case, that impediment, as it invariably is, is a branch of government. One of the great fears of the founding generation. Uh, government can't be trusted to be the guarantor of a person's liberties. The individual man needs to have his gun to be able to, to plant his flag in the ground and say, you know, government, this far, no further, stop here, like, you know, whatever. Martin Luther King Jr. applied for a permit to carry concealed weapons after angry segregationists bombed his house. Yeah, and Dick Heller was denied a permit in the District of Columbia. You were whining because he's white and went into court and got his day, and now you're whining because a black man was was under the same yoke as a white man. Now, it is of course true that the history was not as uh, good to King as it is to Dick Heller right now because one is alive and one is dead, but nevertheless it remains the case that the same oppression afflicted both persons. But curiously, when a white man finally goes to court and gets justice that's bad, uh, even though that means that the same uh, yoke that will be on, on him, the same boot that will be on the back of his neck, will also be on the back of the neck of black folks. For some reason, that doesn't cause you to stop and go, hey, wait a second. If we just stop standing in the way of people's liberties, the same tide of liberty will make all ships rise together. But you say, no, actually, this is racism and it's bad, and we need to, we need to I guess, step in and take away the rights of Americans because... In the past, some subset of Americans had their rights taken away, and, and if we're going to be fair, damn it, equal protection clause, we need to equally oppress everybody or some stupid shit. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm glad you're not an American citizen, and I'm glad that you don't vote in our elections. Have a good day.